We've called this podcast Ways to Change the World because it's, it's about people's ideas. And I imagine that as a young Australian Jewish boy who was, who was heading for Israel, you, you must have dreamed of changing the world. Oh, yeah. I probably wanted to be prime minister when I was 17. You've got to remember, though... Uh, of Australia or Israel? Of Israel, always of Israel. You've got to remember, um, my, uh, my father was a survivor of the Holocaust, came to Australia as a refugee after the war. Uh, my mother's family were Polish Jews who were lucky. They got out in the late 1920s, and they stayed. Uh, I don't know what their fate would have been. And so uh, I think growing up in that sort of family, I, I, I have no doubt that that affected the path that I took uh, in the future. What's your first memory of sort of being aware of being Jewish? I think it was always there. It was something that didn't didn't need even to be said. Uh, it was it was clear that it was part of uh, your identity. Um, it was family. It was it was culture. It was heritage. Um, my father spoke with an accent because he of the German connection. I'll tell you a story about my father. My father was born in Magdeburg, Germany. That's in the east. What used to be the German Democratic Republic, yes, the communist part of the country. But he was born there in 1931. So that was the wrong place and the wrong year for a Jew to be born. He was named after his uncle, my uh, great uncle, who died fighting for the Kaiser on the Western Front in the First World War. And there's a good word in English. He, uh, after dying, received the Iron Cross for dying for the Kaiser and the German fatherland. So think how that sort of experience, that same fatherland in inverted commas comes and, and wants to then murder you. How does that affect the family? How does that affect the children, me, of that sort of family? So you, you, you must have been brought up to hate Germany. No, I don't think I ever hated Germans. Probably hate Nazis. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think I ever hated Germans. Uh, there were many good Germans. Uh, there's a story. You want me to tell stories? Sure. My grandfather, there's Kristallnacht, where many Jews were arrested and taken away and never came back. I think 38. And uh, my grandfather was tipped off by a good German policeman, and he went into hiding. And so when they came to arrest him that night, he was not at home, and... He came back a few days later. Had he been at home that night, had he not been tipped off, maybe he would have been murdered like so many others. And so a good German tipped off my grandfather. So, so you, you were brought up with these stories and this culture, but you became quite a sort of a radical young Jewish man in, in Australia. Uh, and you were, you were sort of a lefty student mm -hmm. at that stage. I mean, what did you want? What was your dream at that stage? You know, when you're 17 or 18, your your ideas tend to be more idealistic, more romantic. I think I wanted to be a kibbutznik, you know, to be a socialist uh, on the land, uh, a proletarian, you know, uh, returning to the working class, building a labor Israel. But but there was never any doubt that your future was in Israel, even though you were born and brought up Australia. Correct. Did you face racism in Australia or anti-Semitism so. in Australia? Nothing serious. Uh, uh, that was not, I don't think, any sort of primary motivating factor. I think, look, Australia is a wonderful country. And, you know, people who live in Australia are very privileged. Good climate, good economy, good quality of life. But I think I always felt, as a young person in Australia, that, you know, it would be wrong if I would stay, you know, in Australia and have a good life and look after myself and m my country in, in the Middle East is going through a difficult time. Remember, I, I still remember vague memories of the Six-Day War of 1967. I definitely remember the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Because you were born in 1960. So Correct. As a, as a young child. So I have, I have these memories and the idea that I would stay in Australia and live the good life and my fellow countrymen would be, you know, having a difficult situation, I, I, there was something that was wrong. So your identity was always as an Israeli in, in Australia? As a Jew. Right? And, as a Jew in Australia? Uh, correct. So when did you become an Israeli? Uh, legally, when I... Uh,
Well, I mean, in yourself. When did you identify? Yeah, I always, I always wanted, I think, uh, to move to Israel. It was something that I grew up with. You've got to remember, my parents moved to Israel in the 50s. They lo- lived on a kibbutz, and after a while, they went back to Australia. But it was always part of the family, a very Zionist family, a very, um, uh, you know, Israel is, is, is important for us. It's part of our identity. Because your, your, your job as a, as a, as a spokesman... Um, I've never seen you as as party political in any way, and and I you know wh- whatever your personal political views, you have defended Ehud Olmert, Benjamin Netanyahu, with equal vigor. Um, is that because you've always seen your job actually just as a spokesman for your country rather than your government? I think that's part of it, and also look, I joined the public service, right? I'm a career diplomat. It's true that. As a spokesman, I was working for different prime ministers, but my salary was always paid by the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which I joined in 1990. And so I always thought it was my obligation, my job, to represent the democratically elected government of Israel and to to explain the positions of that government to international audiences. So you, you, you went to Israel and you dreamt of being a kibbutznik. Just explain what that means. You know, it's it's strange. It's like a, it was part of, as you said, I was a socialist at the time. Um, so I remember um, the idea was I was going to reject bourgeois Jewish life in Australia, and I was going to be a member of a kibbutz. I actually was a member of a kibbutz. Uh, and uh, Which is basically a sort of a, a farm. A collective farm, a yeah. socialist farm, yes. I remember I was very happy. They had a vote on the kibbutz after I was there for a year, and they accepted me as a member. I was very proud that they accepted me as a member of the cooperative. What did you do? Oh, when I first got to the kibbutz, I worked uh, in agriculture. I worked with avocados, and then I worked in bananas, and I milked the cows. Hard work. It was fun, though, you know. And uh, and then I, I went to uh, teach in the kibbutz high school. Uh, I uh, I taught uh, history and politics to uh, tenth and eleventh graders. And how how did that experience form your identity? The kibbutz experience. Yeah. Well, the only thing probably left from the kibbutz with me is uh, my wife, who was born there. So I have this joke with my wife. Whenever she gets angry with me, it's really it's not my fault. It's 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 sitting in the bomb shelter as a baby in her mother's arms that 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 she has a trauma from that period. Now, it's probably true that she has a bit of a trauma, but how can I say this? Um, she grew up on the kibbutz. She grew up in the collective education system. Uh, she's very critical of that education she received. Part of, the, part, of the, part of the reason I don't have the same social views that I had when I was 18 and 19 is a function of seeing it in reality. Oh, really? Are you, so you, you, chain, you, you, you ditched your socialism as a result of being on the kibbutz? Uh, more than one factor, but yes. I think there's no doubt that that system, it has advantages, but I believe the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. What were the failures? I think the idea that uh, um, you can encourage people to be mediocre, that you can encourage people that there's no need for them to be particularly creative, that uh, you encourage people uh, not to excel in what they can do well. Now, let, let's be clear. The, the kibbutz movement has produced many very creative and, 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 and exciting people. Uh, Amos Oz, the Israeli writer, who lived for many, many years on a kibbutz. But ultimately, he too left the kibbutz in the end. Um, I'm sure people would argue with me. They'll tell me I'm wrong, but you're asking me what I think. And so instinctively, did that mean that you've, you've, you've fallen to the right of Israeli politics? after that experience, yourself? In Israeli politics is more complicated because in Israeli politics, the divide isn't just... Uh, there's a divide on the socioeconomic issues, okay? Someone is more capitalist liberal and someone is more socialist or social democratic. That's one divide. You have a divide in Israel between, uh, let's say, a more hawkish approach or a more dovish approach, and not necessarily is there a correlation between the two, the two uh, uh, spectrums. You have a third... Uh, uh, continuum in Israel, which is not, it's very debated uh, in Israel, less known uh, abroad or less understood abroad, which is the whole thing of religion and state. And to what extent should Israel be a secular, liberal, pluralist country? And what extent should it be more traditionally Jewish? And those three uh, uh, spectrums, you don't, uh, there's not necessarily, there can be, but there's not necessarily a correlation. In other words, you can find someone who's 
uh, very right wing on the religious issues he wants to see Israel as a Jewish, uh, and but uh, on the let's say on the uh, national security issues can be a dove. And and so when you ask people in Israel on the right or the left, you've got to be more specific. Well, okay. Well, what, what did you think about the Palestinian issue as a young man? I think I was always aware that the Palestinians uh, were a people uh, and they wanted national self-determination. And that that was right? That they, that they had, uh, that their desire, that just as I as a Jew was a proud Jew and wanted my people to have national self-determination, that I understood them as well. Because you've always said that, haven't you? That you, you understand that the, the, the two-state solution was your, was your understanding of the future. I always understood Palestinian national aspirations. You know, there are some people who, uh, if you look at uh, uh, even early labor Zionists, they thought, oh, the Arabs will welcome us because we will improve the standard of living and we will create uh, jobs and and, uh, the economic development of the country. And no, you can't buy someone's pride. Uh, uh, If I just wanted economic life, I should have stayed in Australia, yes? So I, I do, I think understand and can empathize with Palestinian national aspirations. And still, that's the case? Yeah. That hasn't changed, no. the way your economic no. politics changed? No. It's not, it's not the, 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 the view from the current government, though, is it? On which issue? On, on, on the establishment of a Palestinian state. Look, here you have to make a distinction between how uh, Palestinians see statehood and how maybe British people see Palestinian statehood and how Israelis see Palestinian statehood. Because if you say to me, uh, oh, a two-state solution, that's a way to solve the problem, that's the way for peace, yes? So Israelis will say, and what sort of Palestinian state are we talking about? And you can't run away from that. Because if a Palestinian state is just a, a, a superior platform to continue the struggle against Israel, right? So I'm not interested. Why would I be interested? If a Palestinian state is part of reconciliation and peace, that's a different story. Uh, when Palestinians stand up and say, I want a state, right? So I'm allowed to say as an Israeli, and what sort of state? Once again, is it just a superior platform for you to continue your struggle against me? Because if it is, you should not be surprised that I'm not going to embrace that. If a Palestinian state looks like Gaza, if a Palestinian state looks like Syria or Iraq or Libya, that's not good for me. It's not good for Palestinians either, quite frankly. And so when someone says, someone says the two-state solution is the solution, fine, but there are a lot of assumptions there that have to be uh, uh, analyzed. Just to say the Palestinians should have a state, okay, I'm not hostile to, to Palestinian national aspirations, but I want to understand what is this all about. I'd ask the following question. Does the Middle East have an interest in another failed state? We've got too many already. Well, you, you don't set out to create failed states, do you? No one sets you, out to say. If you no ever one. got to the point of a of a Palestinian state, it would presumably be within a state of peace. I would, well, um, no, but you've seen a deliberate attempt by some to divorce Palestinian statehood from peace. In other words, people say the Palestinians need a state, full stop, right? And then we'll talk about peace later. And I think that position, while well, I understand some people have, it's clearly not the Israeli position, not of the Israeli right and not of the Israeli left. I mean, you, you say you understand the Palestinian desire for statehood. Uh, and why they would feel the way they do about uh, Israel. I mean, so how far does your empathy go? I mean, have you have you been to Gaza? Yes. When when were you there? Years ago, years ago, years ago, years ago. So how how much do you think of the sort of the the, the mindset of the the modern Palestinian young man? Do you understand? I mean, cause you haven't really been there during. No, I haven't been there. And any any difficult time have you? But I I, I can empathise with the frustration. I also think um, I understand young people who are in a bad situation and then it's explained to them, oh, you're in a bad situation because of them, me, because of the Jews, because of those terrible Israelis. It's all their fault. And when objectively the situation is not good, it's, and it's very clear that there's uh, you're pointing, it's all because of someone else. It's never your own leadership's fault. It's never someone else's fault. It's always our fault as sure. Israelis. So that's a narrative which is very dangerous, but unfortunately very popular. I think this is not something that the Palestinians have alone. 
Um, but obviously Israel has its faults, but we're a very self-introspective uh, society, self-critical society. You see that in our political debates, in our newspapers, in the books we produce. So you, you don't have the same level of self-criticism in much of the Middle East and with the Palestinians too. So if you ask me what's the frustration with young Palestinian people who I can empathize with, it's the situation is not good and it's all Israel's fault. And that's where we've got a serious problem because if Palestinians aren't willing to look at their own mistakes and what they've done wrong. I'll give an example. You raised Gaza, and I know the situation in Gaza is very difficult. But what did Israel do in Gaza? Uh, rightly or wrongly, just over a decade ago, we pulled out from Gaza. We took down all the settlements. We, uh, we uh, redeployed behind the 1967 line. It's almost as if we took an editorial from a British newspaper and we turned it, Ariel Sharon at the time, turned it into Israeli government policy, okay? So you can say Israel did right, Israel did wrong, but the fact is we took down all the settlements and we pulled back to the 67 line. Now, if a young Palestinian is growing up in Gaza and being told the whole time your suffering is because of Israel, is that really true? They don't have to just be told, though, do they? Because if you're a young Palestinian, you've lived through various wars. You've lived through the bombing. Um, and possibly your home being blown up or the, the tap on the roof and having to get out. And it's a terrifying thing. I mean, I've, I've seen very little of it myself, but I mean, I've seen some of it. And it's a pretty terrifying place to be. And so it's not just what you're told, you're experiencing it too. And I, just, I wonder, you know, do you, do you empathize with that as well? You know, that, that the sense of enemies being created is easy to understand. Look, I, it's not it, just about education, is it? It's about lived experience. No, but it's also about incitement uh, and quick, easy solutions. Once again, just Israel, as if you're a place where Palestinian rockets are coming down right. in Israel, you will have the same, you will have the same mindset. You but, will regard them as enemies. No, but I don't accept that there's a parity. I, 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 we spoke about it a moment ago. How many books have been written in Israel, self-critical, examining what happened in sure. 1967? Can I give you another example? I've never been there. Maybe you have. The Arafat Mausoleum in Ramallah. Uh, the, there was recently a huge piece about it in the New York Times, which I enjoyed reading. And um, obviously the mausoleum is dedicated to Mr. Arafat, who many Palestinians or most Palestinians think is the father of their national movement. But they've also got little uh, places where they, uh, they pay homage to other important Palestinian national figures. And one of the people still there, enshrined in this new mausoleum, is Khadja Minel Husseini, who was the Mufti of Jerusalem. He was the leader of the Palestinian national movement in the 20s and the 30s and into the 40s. A man who the Nuremberg uh, war crimes trial, not Israel, said was a Nazi war criminal and a collaborator. A man who spent the war in Berlin and was active in um, trying to get Muslims in the Balkans, I think primarily uh, Bosnian Muslims, to volunteer for the Waffen SS. Now this is a very extreme example of the point I'm trying to make. Is Palestinian society self-critical? Are they willing to look at their own mistakes? Or is it all too easy for them? It's all Israel's fault. But I actually know there isn't really a free culture uh, in, a, in a lot of Palestinian areas. There's not a vibrant political debate and different political parties because they're living in a, in a particular, uh, you know, war environment in which Hamas, uh, you know, has got a grip. So, so there is no simple culture like that. It doesn't mean to say that people are not having those conversations quietly or those thoughts quietly and are questioning their own, you know, their, their own situation. It's just different to the way well, wasn't Israel is because Israel is a, you know, is, is, is a more of a democratic society. I agree. I agree with what you've said. But first of all, I'm talking about, not talking about Gaza. I'm talking about something in Ramallah on the West sure. Bank. Yeah. And secondly, the Palestinians, like the Jews, have a large diaspora today with many intellectuals at many universities, right? you still don't see the same level of serious internal debate. What, what I want to get towards, though, is, is your, your, your vision for the future. I mean, what do you think is possible? I'm actually uh, cautiously optimistic about the future because some very, very interesting things are happening in the region. Uh, you're just back from Syria. Um, 
The region is going through a crisis, a crisis that probably started with what was called at the time the Arab Spring. I don't know what we're supposed to call it today. What do we call it today? Uh, well, the failed Arab Spring. Okay, the failed Arab Spring. And you have a situation today where across the region, Arab governments that never used to talk to Israel, that were hostile to Israel, that viewed Israel as an enemy, are today talking to Israel. Arab governments who never in the past wanted anything to do with us are today cooperating with Israel. And I'm not just talking about Egypt and Jordan. Where you, we, you mean because you have a common enemy in Iran? Correct, correct. We have common... I don't want to get there yet. Oh, I'm, no, I'm just saying, <laughs> but you asked me about the peace process. Yeah. These new relationship that Israel has with the Arab states, they give me reason to believe that we can move forward. Because, remember, think from Israel's but point of view... what do you mean by move forward? To build a, a Middle East where Arabs and Jews can cooperate, where Israelis and Palestinians can have peace. You've got to remember, from Israel's perspective, like, we're a country, and all our land neighbors were close to us. And so we had to, you know, build a, an airline and, a, uh, you know, and ships, and that we get to Europe. For the first time, in a serious way, the Middle East is opening up to us, and it's very exciting. And it, it, it promises much for the future, and I think as Israel is more and more accepted as a legitimate part of the region that in the end has to affect Palestinian thinking too because the Palestinians ultimately are an integral part of the region, an integral part of the Arab world. I mean, obviously, you work for the prime minister, so you can't, you, you can't take an opposing view to what, to what he says. But you, you, what you're saying is interesting because, you know, e even though you have a man leading your country still, for the, for the time being at least, who won't talk about two-state solutions, you, 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 do, you still think that is part of the future? First of all, can I correct you with your permission? He was here in November. And uh, he was at Chatham House, and he was asked about that, and he said unequivocally he does not believe in a one-state solution. He said that in front of the audience, and he's repeated that since. Uh, it's clear to me that he wants peace, and maybe, I mean, in, people couldn't be cynical. I mean, Israelis and Palestinians have been trying to reach peace for many years, and we haven't succeeded. Maybe... We're allowed to be a little, once again, I say cautiously optimistic because of these new relations with the Arab states. Can that be the game changer that can help us get to where we need to get? What, simply because you'll have cooperation over what's going on with Israel, sorry, with, with, with Iran and Syria, you mean? Yeah. If Israel and the Arab states are strengthening our relations... You're right, because of Iran. These are dangerous bedfellows to get into, aren't they? I mean, if, are you talking about uh, an Israeli-Saudi alliance to stop... Iran and Syria and Lebanon uh, linking up. So can I ask you, you're a citizen of the United Kingdom, I am not. But your country has a relationship with Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states, and, and America does, and the Europeans do. Israel shouldn't? I, I, I'm asking you are, you, are you, are you proposing that? I mean, that's, that's an intriguing suggestion that you're proposing. I mean... We are seeing a convergence of interests between us and our Arab neighbors. Not one, not one specific country. We're talking to more Arab countries than ever before in the history of the Jewish state. It's very interesting. It's based, as we've said, on a convergence of interests. The people who threaten them threaten us, and by working together, we can deal with those threats more effectively. So you would expect those Arab states to pressure their Palestinian uh, colleagues to do some sort of deal. Is that how you see it working? I think I wouldn't use that language. As Israel is accepted as a partner in the region, as a legitimate country in the region, that has to affect also Palestinian things. But if you're asking on the tangibles, it also... Look, one of the, the problems we've had in the peace process, yes, is that Israel is expected to put very tangible things on the, ta on the table, right? And Palestinians, as you know, are smaller and weaker, and Palestinians put intangibles on the table, you know, goodwill, no more war, but they aren't, it, it, not, not the sort of tangibles that Israel's expected to put on the table. If you bring in the Arab states, yes, and they have many serious tangibles they can put on the table, do you not make a peace process uh, uh, more viable? Do you make it not more doable? Now, once again... When do you see this happening? Oh, you're Give asking. me a time frame. Um... I don't, I don't know how quickly. There's talk now of the Americans putting some sort of proposal on the table. 
the Americans have said shortly. I don't know if that means by the time this program is broadcast or not, yes? But uh, um, we're all, uh, the idea is to do a sort of a regional approach. For many years, it was said by me, maybe by you, that if Israel and the Palestinians can make peace, then that opens up the wider Arab and Muslim world to Israel. I think that's the basis of the original Arab peace initiative from the beginning of the century. That if Israel can make peace with the Palestinians, so we can have an Israeli embassy in, in, in Baghdad and in, in Islamabad and in Jakarta, Indonesia. Yes, that the minute Israel makes peace with the Palestinians, that opens up all these opportunities for, for the Jewish state. That may be true. But quite possibly, the opposite is, is going to happen. In other words, instead of in, out, we're going to go out in. Better relationships with the Muslim and Arab world create a situation which makes peace with the Palestinians doable. And, and do you think Trump is a, is a key factor in that? Look, Trump is very interesting. I watch Channel 4 News, and I know that Trump isn't uh, the flavor of the month. Okay. And that's probably not just Channel 4 News. That's across British opinion. It's not, it's not our opinion. We're just reporting what people think. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Um, you have to know that in the Middle East, Trump is actually popular, both with Israelis and with Arabs. Uh, Arab government after Arab government is, uh, is thinking that his, his, um, his policies on the Middle East are more in tune with reality than his predecessors. You've got to remember uh, a few things. Um, number one, he made his first trip abroad as president after inauguration. He went to Saudi Arabia where he met the Saudi leadership and regional leadership, yes. He met leaders of the Arab countries. Then he came straight to Jerusalem. We've never had an American president on his first trip, you know, tour abroad come to our country as well. So it was, he was showing that he cares about the region. Second, you will recall, I think it was halfway through uh, 2017, uh, there was a, a, another atrocious use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. And uh, Trump did a surgical missile strike, I think it was 49 cruise missiles on Assad yeah. regime targets. That use of surgical military force was welcomed by Israel and also by our Arab neighbors. I would even argue had Obama been willing to to use force in a similar way, maybe we wouldn't have had a second and third and fourth use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. Because, I mean, does Assad really, I mean, you've just come back from Syria. Does Assad really care that he gets these resolutions against him or does he understand a different language? Well, although you could also argue though that particular airstrike didn't really make any difference to Syria's military capability. It was a purely symbolic airstrike. The fact is we haven't seen, I think my question is still legitimate. We haven't seen a massive use of chemical weapons since. We saw it on a number of occasions. The military response by the United States, since then, at least, we haven't seen another response. Now, so that, that use of force by the Americans was welcomed by us and by the Arab governments as well. The, uh, the, critic, the criticism of the Iran nuclear deal that, that the American president represents, that is something that is welcomed both in Israel and with our Arab neighbors. Uh, even the Jerusalem issue, which we can discuss uh, separately also if you're interested, but, but the Jerusalem issue, which I know the Arab governments were not happy about. But if you actually look at their response, it was very measured. Uh, the, the sort of more violent or the uh, extreme response came from the Islamists. Uh, you'll recall the, uh, it was in Turkey that Mr. Edwan organized uh, the, you know, the Islamic conference together. Arab states either sent very, very low-level representation or didn't come at all. And so I think there is an understanding, at least, that, uh, that Trump is bringing something new to the region that both Israelis and Arabs uh, appreciate. And I would say to a British audience, if I can be facetious for a moment, when Arabs and Israelis agree, British people, people should pay attention because it doesn't happen every day of the week. <laughs> Let's wind back again to, to you and, and, and you arriving in, in Israel. I mean, as I said in the introduction, um, your name was Freiburg. Correct. Why did you change it to, to Regev? I, I, it was a German name. And there's been a tradition in Israel of people, when they arrive in Israel, of Hebrewizing their names. And uh, our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, did it. Uh, 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 
and he's just an example of literally tens of thousands. The idea was when you are returning to your, your roots, you, if you've got a foreign name, you adopt uh, a new Hebrew name. I did it at the age, I must have been 22, 23. Uh, retrospectively, would I have done it? Like, would I, you know, the same decision at 58? Maybe not. But at the age of 23, you see the world differently. And your family in Australia are still private? Yes, my, my mother is still. My father passed away a few years ago. And what, what, what do they make of... Do you have any, any siblings? Or I've got three siblings. What, what do they make of you having a different name and a different identity to theirs? So, uh, um, first of all, my, my sisters have different family names for obvious reasons. Maybe not so obvious anymore, well, yes, but people of my generation, it's obvious reasons. My, my brother has, obviously, the Freiburg name. When my father passed away, and, and in the Jewish tradition, when... when uh, someone passes away, you sit in the house all together for seven days, yes? And my older sister, who's very much an older sister, she told me something I never knew. She said that when I changed the name, I very much offended my father, right? And when I was 23, I didn't think about that, yes? But you live and learn. How did you feel about I felt that? I was felt bad about that. But I wasn't thinking about that. I, was, I wanted to be the new... Zionist drainer of swamps on the kibbutz. And did he, did he ever? Never tell said you a that? word. To, never no. said a word to me. And were you surprised? I wasn't surprised. Well, I mean, the minute she said it, I, I probably knew it to be true. I just hadn't thought about it. You you also um, you were Ehud Olmert's uh, spokesman, and then Netanyahu comes along, and you're you're presumably expecting to be out. That's probably true. Yes. So so were you surprised when he asked you to stay on? Uh, I didn't take it for granted, no. I'm not sure I can talk about it now, but uh, uh, it was that, how that whole ha- thing happened was very interesting at the time. And, 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 and there's no sort of problem for you politically as a, as a spokesman? You don't need to agree with the person you're working for? I don't, think I, could, I, should, I, I don't think I could be an effective spokesman and disagree with the person I'm working for. I think to be an effective spokesman, once... Uh, uh, during, I think, the second Gaza war. Uh, on France 24, I'm doing an interview, and they start reading out this thing, uh, Mark Regev, we heard you're leaving the Israeli government and going to work for Philip Morris. Right? I said, what? They said, well, there's this story out there, and someone had written this very facetious story saying that Regev, uh, you know, who... Uh, it was, uh, you know, an, an anti-Israel piece, but it was saying uh, Regev uh, has decided he's going to be more moral, and instead of being the spokesman for the Israeli government, he's going to work for Philip Morris. I could never work for Philip Morris, right? never. I think part of being an effective spokesman means that you have to actually b- believe what you're saying. Have you ever had to go out there and defend something that you were uncomfortable with? Like we did a few interviews during difficult times, right? I remember saying uh, in wartime, when you get it wrong and, and, and let's say innocent people are caught up in the crossfire, I would always say, we didn't want this to happen. That's, and that's the truth. I would always say, we don't target innocent civilians. That's the truth. You could say to me as an interview, but are you doing enough to prepare? Yeah. That's, that's and also a, who we is. Because we, we, we might be you and the prime minister. It may not be the people on the ground or the individual commanders or any, any of that. I accept that. I do. I've looked into these issues, though, because it, it, it was my bread and butter for a long time. Right? The whole idea that somehow the Israelis are callous uh, uh, in their attitude towards uh, civilians in, in conflict. I was at a university recently and uh, someone raised this issue. And I said, I urge you to look at uh, the civilian to military casualties in all modern conflicts. You can look at Iraq with British and Americans. You can look at Afghanistan. You can look at uh, the fighting in Serbia, uh, NATO against Milosevic. Israel doesn't, if you actually do a comparison and you look at military action and and innocent civilians getting caught up, Israel actually does very well. But spokesmen in politics are generally often political advisors as well. And I don't know whether you have that role as well. You know, did you find yourself in situations doing interviews where you knew it was hard to defend, you know, the, the wicket you were on, going back and saying, look, this is a problem. We've got to, we've got to do something. We've got to change something. I would, I would always, uh, if I thought it was relevant, I'd always say something to the prime minister. 
the biggest problem in doing interviews, and, and I'm sure we've both been through this, is when something's happened and you're not sure what they're talking about. In other words, I'm doing a live interview yeah. on BBC or CNN or something, and they're saying, oh, reports are coming in from someplace, let's say in Gaza, and they're talking about A, B, and C. And you have to respond immediately because you're in the studio, and you've got no idea yet. And so you get out your smartphone in the corner and see what they're saying, but no one knows. But then, of course, the other side gets their story out straight away. They're saying, you know, Israelis deliberately killed 20 children in a house. And you don't know if it's true or not true, and you don't have any information. They're the hardest things, right, that you do. Because on one hand, if you say nothing, so their narrative becomes the dominant narrative. They've set the story. Yeah? Yeah. Israelis deliberately attacked these children. If, so you've got to be careful. So what you need to say is saying, we're looking into this, we're investigating, which is true. And you say, but our policy is... Of course, yeah. not to target to this. No, there, there was always a Mark Reggae formula, which was we're investigating. We don't know the facts. You don't know the facts either. Uh, and Hamas won't recognize our right to exist and, and want to wipe us off the face of the map and are a dictatorship. Therefore, you know, first of all, all that is true. There is no equivalent. All that so, is true. And, and you can get a long way with those lines, which you did for, for many, many years. And, and what I found, though, to my frustration is that not necessarily with you, of course, but with us, when you had a second interview a week later and you wanted to talk because you did have the facts of what happened before, then no one wanted to discuss them anymore. But you, you talked about this sort of the idea that Israel is callous. And I wonder, did you ever find yourself trying to check yourself to say, I may be part of this problem? You know, that, that my holding the line for my country, which has to be absolutely firm, may also be projecting a callousness about Palestinian lives. So I that's something I've got to guard against. Uh, ho hopefully... Hopefully, I never did that. I always tried, maybe not successfully, but I always tried to express empathy for the human casualties of the conflict. Um, because a human casualty is a human casualty. But you're often asked in an interview to say sorry, aren't you? And, and sorry is a difficult word for any national spokesman to say. It's always, it always comes with a caveat of if we were wrong, then we're, of course we're yes, sorry. Yes, yes. And that always feels mealy-mouthed. And I wonder, you know, when, when you were talking about children in a school or children on the beach. Did part of you as a human being just want to say, of course, this is terrible and it's, it's terrible that it happened? First of all, you've got to understand the context, right? I'm speaking from my side. The other side is all over the media as well, right? What is their message? And it's not that like the other side is showing a lot of empathy for me, yeah. all right? It's not happening in a vacuum. Second thing is, I always said, well, I'm sure you heard me say it, I'd say, we regret this. We don't want to see innocent civilians caught up in this conflict. I'd say that over and over again. But then you would always blame Hamas and say it's their fault. But, but rightly, <laughs> rightly. I mean, ultimately, I mean... But that's why, to some people, it always sounded like a game almost. You know, that this was a tit-for-tat sort of argument. And that, that actually we were talking about human beings here. So I was always aware we were talking about human beings. But I, I, I'd, I'd want to explain why I think I was correct in saying Hamas is responsible. Hamas started these conflicts by shooting rockets into Israel, we were always responding. You can argue legitimately the, as, with the, as to the effectiveness of the Israeli response, was it the right response or not, but we were responding. And the other thing that needs to be said is Hamas built its entire strategy, and still today, on a double war crime. One, we target innocent civilians, correct? Every Israeli is a legitimate target. And secondly, we use our own civilian population as a human shield. We will, we will shoot out of mosques. We will shoot out of schools. We, will, we are, in fact, uh, I believe Hamas made a very, very cynical strategy of saying, you know, actually more casualties are good for Hamas. See, as, as you say, I've just come back from Syria. What is, what's striking to me is that the language used by the Syrian government to defend its um, attacks on places like Eastern Ghouta or Idlib or Aleppo is strikingly similar to the language you use with regard to the Palestinians. I, I saw that woman you interviewed, I forgot her name, the Member of Parliament, yes. I think. And I watched her, and I watched your interview, and I, I urge you to look at what she said and what I said, and I believe they are fundamentally different. Why? Because... Because you both say, look, we're under attack, they are attacking us, they're attacking indiscriminately, we are victims of their rocket attacks. If you lived under this kind of attack, what would you do? But I would always say that the people of Gaza are not our enemy. I would always say we're trying to be as surgical as, as humanly possible in a very difficult combat situation. I would always say we didn't want this conflict in the first place, that we are responding to aggression against our civilians. Uh, and I think all that, to, I believe very sincerely, all that to be true. 
So you, you don't you don't see those arguments and see, you know, any any refrain or any similarity between your position and their position. And the Assad regime. You know, cause, cause, yeah, because what, what they're arguing is we have a civilian population which is under attack by a small, you know, bunch of bunch of rebels and they're killing civilians and so we're dealing with that. And that's essentially what you have always argued you were doing with the Palestinians. I, I don't think... I mean, we're always trying to be surgical. We're trying to avoid civilian casualties. I don't think the Assad regime goes anywhere near that, to be frank. Do you think it would help if more Israeli soldiers had been prosecuted or taken to task for individual failures? You know, in all wars, in all armies, there are individuals who get it wrong. The Israeli army can be no different. For sure. Yet there have been so few cases which have been taken all the way. And compared to British soldiers? No, not compared no, to no. anyone. I'm just saying, all right, so do you, you think it would help? If you compare Israel to perfection, I'm sure we fall short. If you compare Israel to other democratic societies fighting wars against terrorists in urban areas, I think we probably come out quite well by comparison. You take a lot of flack for all of this, don't you, over the Of course. Years? That was but my job to do, take that does it, does it ever get to you? Uh, no. I was always very proud to do my job. And uh, I'll tell you the truth. Um, I've had two kids in the Israeli army, right? I remember uh, going into the canteen uh, during uh, the last Gaza war and sitting with a friend from the foreign office who had a son in a combat unit. And I said to him, Benny, how are you sleeping at night? You know, making conversation. And he looks at me and he says, easy, we don't. So I was, you know, no one was shooting at me. Have you been in that situation with your kids? Uh, not in the Gaza war, no. But why do I say this? I mean, I might have been receiving, on the receiving end of difficult questions from you and from other journalists, but no one was endangering me. What was the worst thing that could have happened to me? I could have slipped on a banana peel between the Channel 4 studio and the, and the, and the BBC studio, yes? No. Many young Israelis were in physical danger, and so you have to put your own, your own, your own self in perspective. And are your children out of military service? My son is out, and my daughter will be coming out shortly. What's that like? knowing that your children are targets? It's, it's, it's difficult for parents. We are one of the few democracies that has compulsory military uh, service, though I know that I think Sweden and some of the Eastern European countries have recently re reintroduced. Um, it's interesting as well, there's not really a debate about that because I think people understand that, unfortunately, we still need it. I mean, you've been to Israel. Yeah. I mean, you go to Jerusalem, you go to, you go to the old city and you... You see these young, scared-looking soldiers. They're basically kids. They're not, they're not even that old. They're 18, 19 years old. They look terrified, half of them. I hope they don't look terrified. That's not good if the people well, think they I look mean, terrified. Well, I mean, you know, they, they, a lot of them put on a very aggressive front to make up for it, you know, because they don't want to look terrified. But you can tell what's going on inside. Um, and, you know, you, you do wonder what effect this is having on, on the nation. Listen, Israel was born in conflict. Let's be clear. We are celebrating this year uh, 70 years of our independence. And uh, Ben-Gurion, our first prime minister, declares Israel's independence in May 1948 on a Friday afternoon. Right? That same night, right? It's the day the British mandate ends. That same night, the Egyptian Air Force bombs Tel Aviv. The next day, from the north, the armies of Lebanon and Syria invade. From the east, the armies of Iraq and, and, and Jordan. At the time, it was called Transjordan. And from the south, the army of Egypt is invading. And so, unfortunately, the reality is we've had to fight for our independence and for our sovereignty. If we wouldn't be willing to fight for our freedom, um, we wouldn't have it. Now, let's be clear. British people they did the same thing in the Second World War. But that's much more distant for you. Uh, for us, it's something much more immediate. Let's come to this country, because th this is where you are now. I mean, you, you've, you've made some very interesting interventions as ambassador, not least around the, the attitudes that may or may not, depending on your point of view, exist within the British Labour Party. You've had some time to sort of think about this uh, now. D do you think the Labour Party still has an anti-Semitism problem? I think the Labour Party itself would probably say that. What do you think the problem is right now? Let, let's be, first of all, let's take a step back because people say, oh, no, anti-Semitism, that has to be 
That's the far right. That's the National yeah. Front, or what are they called today? National yeah. Action, these crazy uh, neo-fascist or neo-Nazi groups. They're the anti-Semites. You can't have anti-Semitism on the left. It's impossible. It is possible. We've seen it um, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, Proudhon, who's one of the fathers of French socialism, was an anti-Semite. Uh, in Russian socialism, Bukhanin was an anti-Semite. Even in, in this country, you'll have to help me here, one of the first Labour members of Parliament is a man called Keir, um, Keir Starmer's named after him. Hardy. Hardy, thank you. That's the name, correct. During the Boer War, he uses language which is anti-Semitic because he was against the war, as the Labour movement was, but he'd use a, a war of Jewish bankers or something like that. I don't remember the exact language, but it was something, on you know. And so to say the left, because we're on the progressive side of politics, we're immune to what is maybe history's oh. oldest hatred is simply not true. Well, there, there is, there is anti-Semitism and there is anti-racism that runs rich through the history of the Labour Party. But what we're talking about is whether there's a problem now. What do you think the problem is now? Once again, what I say is not important. The fact that Labour itself has said there's a problem and we need to deal with it. What do you think it is? I think there, uh, first of all, uh, um, there's anti-Semitism in, in other places too, yes? But I'd ask you the following question. Just, right? Everyone's, no one wants this, do you? Yeah, I can no. see. If, if, if everyone's entitled to criticize the government of Israel, everyone's entitled to, visit, to criticize the government of the United Kingdom and the government of the United States, right? But why is it that people deny my country's very right to exist? What's that all about? Why, why are my people denied the right to sovereignty and independence? Why is, you know, we support the nationalism of this group of people in Asia who want their freedom and this group of people in the Middle East who want their freedom and this group of people in Africa who want their freedom. But when Jewish people say we want our national freedom, that's, oh, that's wrong. Why, well, that's singling out Jews for something else. What's that all about? We've also and had, those people exist in the Labour Party as far as you can see? I'll, I'll say something else. If someone says... Well, no, hang on, do they, though? I mean, do you believe that, that those people do exist within the Labour Party who hold those views? I think those views have been expressed. I would say um, another thing. Someone, there was a comment uh, two years ago uh, about Jews being responsible for the slave trade. What's that all about? It's got nothing to do with Israel or Palestinians. What, what, Jews for the slave trade. Or, you know, or, or, or Zionists controlling the media. What's that all about? Uh, you, and it's very interesting because these people, you, I think even if you gave them a lie detector, are you an anti-Semite, they'd probably deny it. Have you met Jeremy Corbyn? Yes. W when did you meet him? I don't think I want to go into details. Right. Diplomats have to be allowed to work in, uh, uh, with a certain amount of discretion. And do you accept that he's not an anti-Semite? Uh, he certainly said that, uh, has said that publicly. Look, it's not. That was a long pause. <laughs> Look, I've, I've, you're asking serious questions. I have to think of serious answers. Yeah. Yes. Um, but even what I mean is, it suggests that you're not sure. I don't know what is in your heart. I don't know what. I'm is just in asking heart. you what you think. I mean, I, I, you know, I did a, you know, what became quite a famous interview with him about. I what remember he said it. About I saw it. And Hezbollah. I saw that interview. Well, what did you think? Look, I, I don't understand. I say this very frankly. I don't understand how someone who considers themselves progressive can sit on the same platform with someone who is homophobic, who is a, 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 a misogynist, and who is racist. Who do you mean? Who you talking I'm talking about? about anyone. How can you sit, groups like Hamas and Hezbollah are openly racist, they are openly homophobic, they are uh, of course, misogynistic. They they represent, I would argue, the most reactionary tendencies in 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 modern humanity. I mean, he would say you have to talk to people in order to try and bring about peace, and that's all he was doing. That he doesn't agree with any of those views. Um, that is what he has said about that. You know, that he he rejects many of the things that they believe, but that he was just trying to bring people together as part of the peace process. Do you accept that? I, I I've heard him say that too. Yes. So that's, that's also a very diplomatic answer that you've heard. I'm a diplomat. That. Yes. I'm a diplomat. Well, it's interesting that you don't just say, yeah, you believe him. I mean, look, I believe, I believe, uh, I believe people when they tell me things. Um, and I've heard Jeremy Corbyn speak out against uh, uh, anti-Semitism. 
I heard him speak about out against anti-Semitism very forcefully at the Labour conference. I was there when he said it, not this year, but last year. But do you think he's done enough? Can you ever do enough to fight against racism and anti-Semitism? Is, is, as long as it's still there, you've probably never done enough. But do you think he's doing all he could? I mean, you know, it, it's sort of it's a question of sort of whether whether you think the Labour Party. All I'm trying to work out is, do you think the Labour Party is really serious about tackling this, or do you think there's really a problem that they haven't gripped yet? I'm not sure. It's my job as ambassador uh, uh, of Israel to give some sort of scorecard on that issue. Surely that's a, that's something that that Labour Party members have to decide, and that's something that uh, uh, the British people have to decide. But you, you must have heard a lot of British Jews talking about how they feel about the Labour Party. You know, I speak for the Israeli government, and the British Jewish community has people very eloquently who can speak for them. Do you, do you hear those, those complaints, those worries? Once again, what ambassadors hear is, is... You hear them all, I imagine. Ambassadors hear many things, and it's, I think we couldn't do our job if we talked publicly about everything that we hear. You've already said in this interview that you are hopeful, quietly, about the future. Do you expect to see this? progress this piece in your lifetime? It's a good question. I'm not sure I've got a good answer, but I do know this. It doesn't have to be a zero, uh, um, you know, or zero or one binary, that if total and complete peace is not possible between us and our Palestinian neighbors tomorrow, it doesn't mean it's all that or total war. Is it possible to move closer to the goal that we seek? And we'll get there eventually. So if you say, will we have total peace with the Palestinians anytime soon? I hope so. All I said was in your lifetime. In my lifetime. Decades. Okay, in my lifetime. Well, you know, I'm not young anymore <laughs> as I used to be. But all I'm saying is that, okay, we'll, we'll try. But if it's, if, it's, if it's not possible, so at least we can move the ball. How do you say in British football? You can move the ball forward towards the goalpost. And that is also a good thing. But you would accept that you can criticize the Israeli state. You can be, you can be anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic. No, no, no. First of all, you can criticize the policies of the Israeli government. We do it in Israel more than anyone else. We have a very, very vibrant and uh, public debate on all public policy issues. But what is Zionism? Zionism is the right of the Jewish people to have national self-determination. Uh, Zionism is the right of, of the Jewish people to be free and independent in their homeland. It doesn't say where the final borders have to be in peace. It doesn't say, it doesn't say a specific thing. You can be a right-wing Zionist, a left-wing Zionist. You can be a, a peace Zionist, and you can be a hawk Zionist. You can be a religious Zionist, and you can be a secular Zionist. In Israel, you see all different facets. But I believe to be against the idea that the Jewish people are entitled to national self-determination, I think that is anti-Semitism. That is anti-Semitism. So, so if you're anti-Zionist, you are anti-Semitism. If you say, right, once... I want to say it very clearly. If you say this people in Asia has a right to national self-determination and this people in the Middle East has a right to national self-determination and these people in Africa have a right to national self-determination, but I deny the Jewish people's right to national self-determination, what's that all about? Why are you holding Jews to a standard? Once again, people will criticize... They're not absolutely the same, the Why not? you've given them. Why because not? you're talking about geographical areas and a religious identity now. No, no, no. That's, see, the Jewish people are entitled to national self-expression. Anyone who knows the history of my people in the 20th century knows what it was like for Jewish people before we had sovereignty and independence. Well, Mark Regev, we could talk for a long time more. Maybe, maybe you'll come back at, you know, another time. But for now, thank you very much indeed. Glad to be here. Thank you.